It is sad when mistreatment and abuse and neglect and murder against Indian people becomes common. This is where it started, and this is where it's gonna end. I took the crazy horse and little crow, little six and sitting bull. You can hear the war cry, we ain't crying wolf cry. It's still a good day to tie when you know you're fighting for. Welcome to the Future Generations Podcast. I'm Pablo Mancias. And I'm KP. And we have a special guest, Ani Anse Garza. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. How are you? We're great. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you for joining us. So for our listeners, we want to just do a little bit of education here so you guys can know what we're talking about. A sacrifice zone is an area, a geographic area, that has been permanently impaired or damaged by an industry or economic disinvestment. So that means they go in, extract resources, the area becomes toxic or unlivable, and then just kind of leave. They don't do anything to restore the area. And it's usually extractive industries. And basically, the definition of an extractive industry is what I just said. They go in, extract resources or people's time, energy. It doesn't have to just be resources in the terms of like fossil fuels or anything like that. It could also be people's energy, their labor, and then they'll reinvest into those areas and they leave it permanently damaged. And I know this is a big issue in Texas, specifically in South Texas, in what we call the Rio Grande Valley, which is actually a delta. It's not a valley. It's erroneously named. But we invited Anianse on here because she grew up in the RGV and she has been doing some environmental work and justice work in and around the area throughout her life. So can you just give us a brief understanding of the sacrifice zones and the extractive industry in the RGV? Yes. So I guess for me and a lot of people that have lived in the the Rio Grande Delta, right, known as the Rio Grande Valley for generations, we are familiar with the way that the area has been used as a plantation in terms of like a resource to extract from, but also the people to be able to be resources, not humans, right, <laughs> to be able to extract from us where, you know, a lot of us had our parents growing up picking cotton or picking whatever crop was in the valley in season, you know, in the field, like whole families, including small children out there with like no drinking water or no potable water, people getting sick and all that history that comes with that. But I think like if we go further back and that's the history that nobody talks about is the colonial roots of the agriculture and how agriculture was used to cause dispossession and extraction and the agricultural industry has been a part of that history of taking the land away from people and before them the missions and the institution of the church and how all that is really just a little chain of events but I know that that's not how people have seen it for a long time when they talk about farming or agriculture or these ways and it's because we haven't been in touch and we've been separated from or alienated from our indigenous roots as native original people and that in that way we have been totally disarmed of any kind of defense right Um, to be able to protect our rights to be able to protect the rights of our children to be able to Um, have a sense of identity or connection to that land which we were forced to toil over for generations and so we became just instruments in this plantation right in the plantation which is alive and well in texas and people usually talk about the south they think of all these other states right and even you know when we talk about the the funding that is available for farming in terms of independent, you know, anti-colonial farming, you know, with these practices in the uh, in Texas, it's virtually non-existent, right? Because we are not recognized in a lot of ways as uh, people who have this. And it goes back to the history of genocide, right? Where our kids go to school and they're taught that they're dead basically. And my daughter, you know, how she always has to bring it up. She's only 10, but she's been doing it for, for, you know, 
for like three years now, but having to have the responsibility of bringing that up in school so that the other children understand who she is. And I know a lot of us have, have that experience in terms of Native people, that's Texas, where there's a complete separation of understanding of how the sacrifice zone is really rooted in, I made a note here because like sometimes I go off on tangents, but it's really rooted in taking away our sovereignty and taking away, because one, one thing is the narrative of the sacrifice zone, right? But then the other thing is land back, right? right and we right. can't stop being a sacrifice zone until the Native original people, unless we're able to get our land back. Because that is actually the root. And if we don't acknowledge that, then we are going to continue to be sacrificed, not just by the government, by the nonprofit industrial complex, by little groups, right, that continue to try to dictate and prescribe solutions for Native original people. Right. Well, almost like gate, gatekeeping the solutions to our, our problem. It's like an infantilism, like we don't know what we're doing kind of thing. And that's part of that genocide. Yeah. And that's that's interesting that you say that because a, a lot of people don't know this is going on in the Rio Grande Valley, even in Texas. You know, we have SpaceX that's now there too. And it's like an extension of one man's ego. For the residents there, it's just a continuing narrative, like you said, of not humanizing the residents of the area, treating them as resources and commodifying their labor and their and their lives. Anayanse, if you don't mind me asking, would you say that this is being covered enough in the media or would you say that there isn't enough media coverage? Of, of SpaceX you're talking about? Of what you're talking about in, in, in the RGV. Well, I mean, I think that there's historical archives on, you know, the farm worker struggle and on the different struggles, the way they've manifested themselves within this colonial, you know, plantation system that is still, in terms of, like, Native original people's movement or, you know, sovereignty, that is only something that the Carrizo Come Crudo tribe of Texas, in my opinion, has really done a great job, right, of of being able to breathe life back into us because even the nonprofit industrial complex has taken up space. Even, you know, the, not just the government or the local governments or even, you know, so-called a- autonomous liberal groups, but they're not, they don't know how to relate to Native original peoples. And that's because people aren't talking about the privilege. And it's not privilege, it's like the oppression, right? The oppression that comes from being somebody who still who identifies as Hispanic, right? Or who identifies as, like when you come over here or when you're here and they put a label on you and they tell you you're a white Hispanic. Mm-hmm. And that's something that you put on your birth certificate over time. Mm-hmm. And, and then you start to believe it, right? And then your, your children believe it. And then your grandchildren believe it. And it just goes from there. And then you start treating other people like you're a white Hispanic, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're like exercising this false mask of like, who you are and in your your you become in a lot of ways an oppressor even though you are sharing that reality of the sacrifice zone right we're all in the sacrifice zone together but who are the people that we always sacrifice first we're written into the uh, the agenda and we're on the menu constantly right of, of the sacrifice zone and i think that's the problem we have to talk about we have to peel back the layers right we have to peel back the layers uh, of oppression because we don't want to be oppressed we don't want to be oppressed by by anybody you know we could be elon musk but it could also be other people other yeah. people that because uh, uh, you know what they say microaggressions and macroaggressions they're not necessarily always intentional that doesn't mean that they're not there and, mm-hmm. and that's what impact, what I think. Right. sorry i yeah. didn't interrupt you <laughs> Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was just saying, and that they have impact, too. Like, that's, and, and that's something that, like, I've, I've begun to pick up on as becoming a teacher and, like, working with, like, restorative justice and restorative practices is that, like, it doesn't matter what the intent is. It's the impact, especially with microaggressions and macroaggressions. It's not the intent. You may not have been trying to impact your surroundings in a negative way, but you did. And, and that's the important thing is that, like, you understand what your impact is. And I think we're talking about such specific things, but it, it the way you're explaining it is, like, it's it's a broader thing. Like, it, 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 it kind of encapsulates our behavior towards individuals. How we treat the land is how we treat each other in some ways, right? Mm-hmm. And you brought up an interesting point about how our 
identity because we had to assimilate, right, has caused not just us pain, but others pain, you know, if we adopted a certain colonial identity, right? And I think that relates a lot to the history that's taught here in Texas, yeah. which I think we had a conver conversation over the week about how Texas history, um, unfortunately, is not very accurate. And it's almost too easy to assimilate here. And I know that assimilation was a survival tactic. And I think that's why it's so painful to like uncover the layers, right? And to go through history because it's like, you're kind of opening up all that pain. Wounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think for me anyway, I've had to really look at what the word assimilate even means because I think it's based actually, it, it's a softening of the coercion, right? It's a word that softens the fact that it wasn't really assimilation. It wasn't really like, hey, I'm going to decide this or that. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like people, it was first, it was like people thought that they needed to survive. And even now, even though it's not like they don't chop off your foot or your hand or something, but they are, uh, you know, teaching our children that they're dead when they go to school. So is that really, is that a choice? And, and so it becomes coercion. And then people have developed habits of the plantation. Um, they've developed habits of the plantation to appropriate, romanticize, and co-opt what they think is, right, like indigenous culture sometimes without really understanding what that means or without understanding what what it means to relate to the native original people mm -hmm. and so that takes a lot of time and that takes a lot of intention that takes a lot of self-reflection that takes a lot of self-awareness mm -hmm. and responsibility to do that right um so that so that people aren't creating more harm mm -hmm. um yeah for sure and i i feel that I had asked you about if you felt there was enough media coverage just because I was actually surprised about this topic when Pablo brought it up like I had no idea and I'm someone that tries to remain informed or try to be informed about activist work in Texas so I was just really surprised that there wasn't a lot of awareness out there which is why I just wanted to know your personal response how you felt about media attention because unfortunately native issues are not given the attention they need right right um, and a lot of the climate change activism that Carrizo Con Macrudo tribe does you know and that's and, and for me that's even me like who's associated like that's a lot of my family does the work you know I've worked with Ana Yance uh in the past uh, I'm just beginning to learn a lot of this stuff. I had to go to a training with y'all, and um, it was kind of funny because you guys like know all this stuff. Uh, you, my dad, and some other tri tribal members already know all this stuff because you're well involved with it. I needed the training because I didn't know any of this, mm. um, and it was it was really good. It opened my eyes about a lot of things, and 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 it's it's a lot easier to discuss it because because it's that you're not informed about it. It's not in the media. Mm -hmm. And like, if you try to understand it, there's like so much to, to unpack because it, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. It's been going on in these areas for, uh, since, you know, first contact for it's, it's part of the colonialization. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to come and share that with us to help educate us and our audience. But one of the things we do focus on here is, uh, we could, reconnection journeys and you talked about like you know your uh, relationship with the tribe i've never asked you this so i just kind of want to get this perspective from you is just how has it been reconnecting with your roots and with the tribe and being reconnected can you give us like an insight to that <laughs> that's like a really loaded question i know i'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think it's, I mean, I think it's been a journey. It's a, it's been a, a big journey for me. It's about my daughter and it's important for me to stop generational cycles of trauma. And I feel like a lot of that has been rooted in for my family and, and through generations, right? Cause I think like, I think about gener generational and time in terms of generational impact and change and the way we're living and, I want to be able to to be uh, my authentic self, right? I, and I want my daughter to be able to be her authentic self and to find, discover, you know, to be able to have that, to be able to be connected to, to life ways that we have been, 
you know, intentionally disconnected from so that we can, like I said, so that our children are able to defend themselves so that it's like going out into the world and you don't have any tools, right, to survive because when you don't know who you are, you're open to all kinds of manipulation because people can tell you who you are and they can tell you this is who you are you're going to you're going to do this and this is this is who you are meant to be then you're able then you're not able to truly defend yourself or be yourself uh, and not even just defend yourself right but like to be able to be be who we are as human beings and that that's really important and I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be able to have connected and to be able to to earn right because it's not just about demanding oh now I'm I want to connect and I want to know everything because it's like we have this hunger because we've been disconnected for so long it's like oh it's like you're so hungry for like you want it to happen now but it's happened throughout like this time span of so many generations that it's it's okay and it's powerful to start it's okay and it's powerful to start and value the people who have been making that space, right? To be able to go and see, you know, in Cuevitas, the cave where people were taking care of that fire, right? When the textbooks say, no, there were no Native people here, but you see it with your own eyes, mm -hmm. you know, and you're able to be there in togetherness with other people who are also living and reconnecting so that that to me is really important i think it also addresses the the you know i feel like bu the buzzword has been decolonized right mm -hmm. decolonize decolonize this decolonize that and um sometimes it seems like that word is being used even to colonize us because <laughs> you know? it's like now i'm decolonizing so i'm going to tell you what to do right i'm decolonizing and this is the way you're going to decolonize you know mm -hmm. and it's funny because it's people that are not connected right? right a lot of times it's people that are coming from from these other spaces and they're trying to dictate what does that mean but for us it's just like that sacrifice well for me mm -hmm. it's just like that sacrifice zone term right like I am not a sacrifice zone. Right. My body is not a battlefield. I will not let that happen. And so they make borders on the border, right? These man-made borders, it's occupation, but I'm making a boundary. I'm making a boundary by saying, this stops, this stops with me. And that's essentially to me what it means to be on the front line. Right. It means that people, when people put the, their bodies on the front line, mm -hmm. and that is a way that we are exercising for me, right, or the way I see it, is our, our sovereignty, because that means that we don't have, we don't need a border, we're holding space, we're holding space for, with this boundary, basically, right, our minds, our heart, our spirit, our bodies, our boundary, that, and we're taking up space, we're, so, because people are like, well, how are you going to get your land back, we have to get our sense of self back, you know, because we are the land, and the land reflects who we are, and the relationship that we have. So we have to know who we are. Um, so I don't see those things as separate things. And I think there's also a, it's, you know, when people think of frontline, they think of protesters and all this kind of stuff. And that's, I think that goes back to how, how we see ourselves and like it's not understood that we are, you know, exactly what we're doing and exactly what land back means. So people are so used to thinking of private property, right? Mm -hmm. So then they feel like, oh no, you know, these people are going to come back and take my house or whatever, right? right? right. And it's like, you, no, you know, it, it, do you know where your water comes from? Mm -hmm. Do you know where your water comes from? Do you know when you turn on that switch in your house, do you know where that comes from? Do you know where your food is coming from, right? And then uh, on top of that, to know the history and the relationship of the native original people because you can be an activist and know all those things and then try to train us in what we've already lived and that too is like gaslighting right because mm -hmm. it's like everybody thinks they're an expert and they want to tell us how to live but but that's only something that we can do for ourselves right. and what that actually requires is for people to give up space space that they've occupied whether intentionally or unintentionally and that we need to be able to restore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I want to kind of speak on that specifically and kind of ask you about, you, you called it the the nonprofit industrial complex, which I'd never heard. And it kind of blew my mind because we had a conversation earlier in the week where we were talking about this. And it kind of blew my mind because I've always thought that like 
some of these organizations start off doing good, right? These nonprofits start off by doing good in the community, but then it becomes about serving themselves as an institution. It becomes about the institution itself surviving, and some of that work gets lost. And we, we had a really, really powerful conversation this last week where you explain how that's kind of happened in the Rio Grande Valley with some of those organizations. And we had a, a discussion about toxic masculinity and, and a way some, some of these organization, organizations uh, operate. If that's okay, can you, can you kind of speak on that? I think it all works together, right? That Because it's a way of managing things. It's a way of managing itself, the, the system, right? And part of the way that things are managed is that there also has to be a toehold in movements, right? Or in, in resistance or in, you know, what is it like new ideas of, or reclaiming new ways to do things. So that toehold is maintained by the nonprofit structure, right? Cause then you become accountable to what, right? To the grants, to the funding where you're giving reports, you're giving information. So say you write a grant and you apply for, you know, oh, I'm going to do, uh, frontline women or something like that, uh, or, you know, community organizing. And I've seen this in the Valley, right, where um, where you, you, you basically apply and you don't get chosen, but who has the information at the end of the day, even if you don't get the money, right? Mm -hmm. And where is that information going to? And there's no accountability. There's no accountability. So then, um, so then who's controlling? And also, like, when people put the call uh, for resources out there to be able to sustain nonprofits, right? And, and people that, and I worked in nonprofits, and it's like, then that begins to dictate where, you, where, you, where the work that you're doing and where your resources, which are, you know, ideally would be liberating time from community people that know what they're doing, that have knowledge to be able to work, you know, to, to be able to dedicate full-time efforts on something, right? Because it's like everybody, everybody lives, everybody needs to, to live. And we live in like this capitalist society where you have to buy things and, you know, just basic things that like water, you know, I'm just surprised that we don't have to buy air yet, but it's like, that's, that's what we're having to do. So, but instead of that, it's like, maybe that's the intention. Um, you go and you work and you're like, oh yes, I get to work full time for what I believe in. But really you're, it's like, am I doing that? Because then you start to have to do these other things, right? It's like, you're, that's the negotiable. The negotiable is your time. And remember, we're thinking about time and generations. So every time, every, every moment, that we're um, desviados, right, or like steered away from our own liberation, right, is like precious, right? It's precious because it's com compounded. And so, well, at least that's how, how I'm thinking. And so, um, so I think that's the role to manage us, right? To manage our time, to manage our efforts, and even, um, and to dictate and to prescribe what that will look like. Uh, and to take extract information, and that's that also goes for you know any institution that is trying to support sometimes, even in, uh, intentionally or unintentionally. And then on top of it, we have these little, you know, like little satellite groups or that may not be nonprofits, but are in fact replicating that same structure or decision making or. Um, even if it's the most liberal, it sounds really liberal and radical, but where there's still this, because, you know, we're even co-opting the word deco decolonizing or decolonial, right? Um, where they're still trying to prescribe that to, to the Native original people. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is something that we can only do for ourselves because we're self-determining people. Right. We're self-determining. We're sovereign. And I have one more question for you. And by the way, thank you for sharing so much with us. I'm learning um, I've been learning in this whole journey with this podcast. So thank you for everything that you have shared with us and your time and space and energy. And I wanted to ask, what do you do to decompress and to rest? I think I really have to work on some care. Okay. <laughs> and I mean, I think it's like, it's hard because, you know, there aren't appropriate resources, right, for yeah. us. There's mm -hmm. just not. So it's like, you can 
what does self-care look like? You know, like we have to create that for ourselves too. So Mm -hmm. I think, you know, being able to be in spaces with people that I feel like understand and because that's very precious and very limited in itself Mm -hmm. and where, you know, it's not extractive and where we can build new, like new types of really, or new ways to relate to each other. Or maybe they're not even new, right? Maybe they're just restoring ways of relating to each other, Mm -hmm. but where like, it's not exploitative, not extractive. So, um, I think like the best way to take care of yourself is to be yourself, right? To be mm-hmm. able to be yourself and to be around people that uh, that are are on that journey so that you're understanding or that are just, you know, able to understand who you are. Yeah, and I feel like that's a very honest answer cuz self-care does look different for us in terms of people that are like in activist spaces or um, are doing heavy work around activism because you know that the work is so important and you want the information out there and you want to meet goals, but at the same time, you want to listen to your body and rest. <laughs> but there are certain times okay. when you just push yourself. And I know because I've yeah. experienced burnout in the past. So that's I just was wondering. Well, I think, I think like there's a misconception that you can just unplug. Mm-hmm. And I think like when when it's like for your own when you're when you're struggling for something that has to do with your life basically, right. Right. then then that takes on a different meaning, right? Like, because can you really shut off your mind when, you know, when you're thinking of all these things, something that I'm I'm learning to is like to be able to bring joy in, into my life. Yeah. And like, even ask myself, like, what does that mean? You know, what mm-hmm. does it mean to have joy every day, you know, every day for myself so that my, so that my daughter can see what that looks like, you mm-hmm. know, and that that's not coming necessarily from somebody else or from outside, but how can we be joyful or how can I be a joyful person? Um, so, and, and reckon, I know how to do that for myself so that I think that's also part of, you know, self-care. Like, I think people think like, oh, I'm going to go get my nails done or go to the spa. Well, I, I mean, which is fine. And that's also probably part of it. Like for, for people, if, uh, but I think there's different, different levels and it depends, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but like I said, like even just taking care of yourself, not even just self care, but like, um, it begins to affect, it does it, right. It affects our immunity. It affects our mental health. It affects our bodies. It starts to wear on, on us. If we feel like we're alienated, and I think that feeling of alienation actually is the source of a lot of, a lot of that because it's like a lot of pressure. It's mm-hmm. a lot of pressure, like to have to, to have to be somebody else, right? In a colonial system, to have to like if you have to mask, like you have to go to work, and you have to, um, you know, and and it's obviously like a dominant system, and and people are literally saying you don't exist. Um, yeah, especially in this post-COVID era where people are just work through a whole pandemic and we're expected yeah. to get back to normal right. even though it's not normal uh, yeah and it was never normal it was mm-hmm. like never normal for, for anybody right yeah and now it's like oh well people are still you know like uh like i had somebody tell me you know like i thought covid was a thing of the past like is that still around exactly and, um and i think that um I, th- I think like it's just taking care of of ourselves and each other, mm-hmm. not just in ice because you can't take care of yourself in isolation, right? Like you, for me anyway, I feel like I don't feel good, you know, if the people I care about aren't good. Yeah, um, and we heal through community. Yeah. So yeah, that that makes sense. Um, well, we want to thank you for your time. Um, and if there is any way that um. How can people get in touch with you? Like if they wanted to know more about um, this, would would you say they would follow you on Instagram? Do you feel comfortable with that? Or um, how? Well, I guess like what are they contacted me for? Oh. I guess, um, oh, okay. Let because, me rephrase. Because I think we think of you as like a resource. Uh, yes. And giving us this information and educating uh, you. Or maybe they can go and find resources online like the appropriate way to find resources yeah. maybe i should have phrased the question better yeah, yeah. um so i i, I think we, um, you would where would you point people to um the to right direction the, the right direction to know more about this um i think like the carrizo come crudo web page okay. and i think like some of the leadership because i feel like we're all we all do our part mm-hmm. but i i feel like um to put one person 
you know, as the person, I think like that's the other thing, right? Like the savior mentality that has right. plagued the, the valley and other places, right? Is like that there's going to be um, some kind of like savior, right? And then that also becomes really dangerous um, because then we're like, yeah, save me, you know, and it's going to, somebody's going to save you. They're going to save you their way. Mm -hmm. And that's rooted in, you know, the colonialism also. Um, so I feel like going directly to the source, going to the, the tribe with questions and um, not just questions, right? But like, I feel like there has to be the amount of reciprocity mm -hmm. in, in relationships yeah. like that. So if you're, if you're gonna learn, like how are you also going to give, right? How are we going to, to exchange or have, build that relationship together? Um, because I also have seen like people say, I'm an ally and self-validate themselves right. and do things, right? That is like, wait a minute, you, you're you're only an ally really if the people say you're an ally like right. that is actually what an ally is like somebody has to give consent and i think that's also the broader issue that in the beginning i should have started with was like i think it all is rooted in in consent yeah. and then like right just like we've been saying prior informed consent mm -hmm. so because otherwise it's coercion and i think that shows up in a lot of ways in relationships in the in the activism right in community organizing spaces in government of course and all these all these ways that are like really really oppressive so i feel like keeping that in mind when we're going and trying to use somebody as a you know resource understand that that's a human mm -hmm. and yeah. that like where are we coming from and especially if you're working with Native original people, you know, um, like I think the assumption is that we're not organized All or right. that we're like the, the language of genocide, right? Like, oh, we need to prescribe this for you because you don't know for yourself. Um, that's assuming that we never were organized people that were. And when you're saying that people aren't organized, what you're really saying is that they're not civilized, right? Because civilization is based on a society. And um, so... Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank and you so much. Educating me even like, mm -hmm. you know, I say that all the time and I think of it as a thing of respect. And after this conversation, I'm probably going to use my words a little bit better and, and talking. Well, about no, I mean, like, I understand no, 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 no. it. I understand. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm trying to change my own language. Like instead of resource, no, life good. source, right? Like yeah. just like how yeah. we talk about the water and the air and the land. A lot of times we're seeing resource, but it's a life source. And also we as people are life sources. And, and so that's why I think it's really beautiful when and, um, like from your dad, right, uh, Juan Mancias and Krista, when when we're looking at how we say hello, or um, when we're talking to each other, and like one of the things we say is give life. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're acknowledging each other, right, as these life givers, and um, I think that's just so beautiful. I and up by mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I've, I've learned a lot, even even every time we we have a conversation, I learn a lot. So thank you for uh, for joining us. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to, you know, uh, express yourself on the podcast for our listeners, because, you know, I respect you and um, the things that you have to say. And, and um, you know, really wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, to to come on the show and and, and talk to our, our guests. But thank you so much. Um, thank you uh, to our listeners. Um, this was on Ayanse Garza. This is the Future uh, Future Generations podcast. I'm Pablo Mancias. And I'm KP. Thank you so much. See you next week, guys.